Okay. <clears throat> well, hi everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming and join us for a, a hopefully fun and a little bit more lighthearted presentation. Um, happy Valentine's Day. I hope you're all doing something with your vows or your gals or whoever. Um, uh, today, uh, in honor of Valentine's Day, of course, we thought it would be fun to introduce you to some of the species that we do work with here in Southern Appalachia through the lens of romance. So we are going to be uh, talking about the romantic lives and reproductive strategies of some of our critters here. Um, slide. So I'm sure that when you think of some of the most diverse places in the world, um, these are some of the images that probably come to mind for you. The Amazonian rainforest, of course, which is well known for its species diversity and coral reefs that are, um, you know, rich with aquatic life. Um, but you probably don't often think of your own backyard here in the southeastern United States as being one of these richest places on earth for such a great diversity of species. Uh, slide. Um, but as Tracy mentioned, um, this is a global biodiversity hotspot for lots of different taxa. Um, I used a global map for salamanders uh, because I wanted to really show that there is no more important place on earth for salamander diversity um, than, uh, than right here in Southern Appalachia. We really are the hotspot of the world. Um, for fish diversity, you can see um, you know, the Southeastern region, Southern Appalachia in particular, uh, it just doesn't it just doesn't get any more precious than this here in North America. Um, fun little trivia fact for you is that in the Tennessee River Basin, which um, sort of is most of Tennessee and then swoops through parts of the uh, five surrounding states, um, there are more species of fish than there are in all the rivers of Europe put together. So that kind of gives you some some context for how uh, blessed we are in terms of the richness that we have here. Uh, similar is very true for freshwater mussels and crayfish species as well. Um, we really just have such a such a precious resource here. And there's a really interesting um, reason for that. It basically comes down to uh, geologic time. So there's a huge diversity in Southern Appalachia of different landforms, you know, low mountains, high mountains, steep and not so steep, um, you know, ridge, the ridge and valley region. Uh, you know, that geographic variability also has, you know, leads to climate variability. There's lots of different soil types and geologic features, um, and also some of the longest evolutionary history anywhere in the world. The Appalachian Mountains, uh, many of you probably know, are among the oldest mountains on Earth, and they remain relatively stable for, you know, hundreds of millions of years. So all the species that live here had plenty of time to kind of, you know, evolve and diversify across these varying peaks and valleys from north to south. Um, and also a lot of species that are more commonly found further north were pushed down into the southern Appalachians during um, period ice ages, periods of long glaciation. So in addition to the uh, evolved diversity, there's a lot of um, what we call refugia. Um, refuge diversity down here from when northern species came down during the ice ages. Uh, slide, Tracy. So yes, this is, um, you know, the, that um, kind of diversity of tree species, diversity of geologies and climates, um, you know, are, are what we have to thank for, for how we got here. And all the species that did evolve in the southern Appalachians, you know, did so in these tiny micro ecosystems, whether the north facing side of a mountain or one particular little rivulet that was that was uh, cut off from from surrounding water sources. And they also, you know, they did this to respond to the available resources in their um, tiny little niches, and they did so in tandem with all of the species around them. So not only is there a lot of species diversity, there's also a lot of ecological diversity and food web diversity. Um, and, you know, as these species got further and further refined into their individual niches, uh, they had to get really creative in order to outcompete other species and ensure the survival of their genes into the next generation. And in freshwater systems in particular, some of our species have gotten very creative indeed in how they have figured out how to do that. And that's what we're going to focus on today. 
Um, so Tracy, I think it is time for our next poll. All right. Um, and this poll, um, we're just going to use the chat. Uh, I think, oh no, actually, I'm going yeah, to launch a poll. <laughs> so um, here's a photo. And we ask, can you guess what this is a picture of? What those circles are in the water? And we've given you four choices um, muscle flat, underwater crop circles, sunfish nests, or sunken rocks. Anybody want to guess? And this species is for uh, this species, this um, picture is from a tributary of the Clinch River in southwestern Virginia. That's right. So our friend from Wise, Virginia, has probably been here. All right, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And uh, half of the folks said muscle flats. Some said crop circles. I love it. Um, <laughs> not right. Um, but 33% said sunfish nests, and that is correct. These are pictures of sunfish nests. And uh, Kat is gonna tell us a little bit more um, about sunfish nests and uh, fish and other reproductive strategies. So Kat, I'm gonna yeah. turn it over to you. Thank you very much. So we sort of have this presentation structured uh, into a, a um, chronological story of romance, if you will. Um, so we, we are going to start off with courtship, and we're going to tell you a little bit about courtship behavior in the world of freshwater fish. Um, so I would imagine that if you were planning a vacation and somebody handed you um, a snorkel and a pair of fins, and told you go off with these snorkel and fins somewhere and um, try to find yourself some incredible wildlife. Where do you suppose you'd go? You can go ahead and slide, Tracy. Um, you might go to Key West. You might go if you had the time and the and the cash. You might hop on over to the Great Barrier Reef and you know see some of the the glorious fish and aquatic species that are over there. I think generally speaking, when we think about where you go to see uh, incredible underwater sites, the coral reefs are what come to mind for most people. But lucky you, if you live in the Southeast region, you don't have to go on a big trip to see some of the most incredible, uh, bright, beautiful displays of color anywhere in nature because we have them right here in our backyard. Um, and you can slide, Tracy. So that's, a, that's actually a buddy of mine that we go river snorkeling together quite a bit there in the back of that picture. Um, yeah, some of the most beautiful fish diversity anywhere on earth can be found right here in our rivers. During the springtime, it'll rival any coral reef on earth that you could go to, so uh, pretty awesome. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about, just very quickly about bright colorations in nature in general. Um, you know, what is the purpose that they serve? How did it evolve? Um, I think probably the kind of bright color, uh, coloration that we might be most familiar with uh, from, you know, nature programs and National Geographic and things like that is what's called aposematism. So there's your first fun word for the day, aposematism. Um, you can pop to the next slide, Tracy. Um, and this little guy here on the left is displaying aposematism. That's a poison dart frog. And one of the most important reasons for bright colorations in nature is to warn potential predators that they might not want to eat you. Uh, another obviously very important um, uh, uh, reason for, for bright coloration in nature is uh, a not as fancy word and it's called luring. And uh, this spiny spider on the right hand side there, he's brightly colored because moths can see uh, the back of his shell at night and they mistake it for a light source and they fly to it and get caught. So bright colors in nature definitely, um, you know, they are, they are here for reasons other just than to delight us. Um, but I think the most well-known um, reason for bright colorations in nature obviously is to attract a mate. And uh, slide Tracy. And that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about next. 
these, every one of the fish species that you see here uh, in this slide is a species that can be found in Southern Appalachia. And you can see just the incredible diversity of, of, of colors and patterns, um, really, really ostentation. They stand out brightly against the backgrounds that they're a part of. I would like to mention personally for myself as someone who hates putting on makeup, that every species in this uh, collage is a male. Um, that's called sexual dimorphism. And basically what it means is that the males tend to be larger and more brightly colored and more flashy because they are doing the work of attracting the females. So the females are always a little bit harder to, to pick out when you're river snorkeling because um, it's the males that are trying to do all the, all the impressive uh, work there. So most of these were taken in late spring or early summer. That tends to be the, um, the breeding season for freshwater fish in Appalachia. They do not remain this bright and color for all year round, unfortunately, but for several months out of the years, out of the year, the males uh, like to color up and, um, and try to attract some females to nest with. So just for funsies, I'll tell you a little bit about a few of the ones on this slide that are my favorites that I like to go out looking for. Uh, the guy in the middle on the right, his name is the snub nose darter. He is native to parts of Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, and North Carolina. Uh, he only lives for 18 months and only has a chance to breed once in his life. So once he's about a year old and he's sexually mature, he's going to start looking around for a female and he'll start to color up in January and sort of he'll, um, you know, these guys will be at their peak coloration by about April. And once they find a lady friend to nest with, they'll lay about 150 eggs um, and maybe a couple of them will survive into the next generation. Um, and I just saw a comment from Andrea and the answer was sunfish nests. Uh, in fact, I'll talk about those on the next slide. Um, Another favorite of mine is the guy that's right, uh, right next to him there. That's the saffron shiner. I love those guys. Very, very common in Western North Carolina and uh, East Tennessee. Um, they're only native to the Tennessee River Basin in the mountains. They live two to three years. They also only get a chance to lay eggs once in their lives and they kind of breed from May to July. So, um, you know, not too much, not too much overlap with the snub nose darter, but you know, in that kind of late April, early May, um, season, if you're in a couple of the streams, particularly up in the mountains in the Cherokee National Forest, you can get them both at the same time. Um, and then all the way on the left there is another one that I wanted to point out, the spot fin chub, that beautiful blue guy over there. Uh, I thought it was particularly important to bring attention to him because he's a federally threatened species and has been for several years. Um, they are really sensitive to changes in water quality, and so their numbers have declined greatly. Um, but they're still out there um, trying to find lady friends and breed and push those genes on into the next generation. So um, they're found again in the Tennessee River Basin that um, they're endemic to North Carolina, Virginia, and Tennessee. They like to breed in May through August. So um, if you're really lucky in early May, you can see all three of these guys and a couple of the other ones all beautifully colored up like that as well um, in these Appalachian streams. Okay, next slide, please. One too many. Yeah, there we go. Um, so as I was just discussing, color isn't the only way that these uh, fancy fish like to show off for their lady friends. Not unlike birds, plenty of fish like to make nests, uh, which is a pretty wild sight when you come across it underwater. Um, these guys here in this slide are ready. Well, the ones on the left are ready or sunfish. Um, the one on the right is a bluegill, and they're a, a fairly common relative of, of bluegill and um, sometimes they're referred to as bream. If you're a, a, a fisher, you might know them as that name. Um, you know, the males of this species, what they're trying to demonstrate with nest building um, is to their prospective mates is that, you know, they're strong, they're capable of, of constructing this impressive and also safe nest for their females. So, um, you know, they kind of look for water that's about one to five feet deep, um, they get they get going when the water is between 70 and 75 degrees, which up in up in the high mountains is a little bit later. So they're kind of, you know, aiming for early summer. Um, the males get down there and they sweep all the debris away from the riverbed. They create this kind of very symmetrical circular depression. There's exposed sand and gravel in the bottom, which is a good place for the female to lay her eggs for them to, you know, work their way down into those safe little crevices. 
Um, and he will uh, make his particular nest. And there's a lot of other male sunfish around him. You saw from that first picture also making their nests. Um, so there's a lot of nests for the female to choose from. So the male kind of has to go out to the perimeter of the nest and sort of flash about and try to get some attention from the local, from the local females and draw them over and make sure they notice his nest in particular. Um, so once he's uh, found a, a lovely female to invite over to his place for, uh, for some Netflix and chill, um, the two will kind of do this cool nesting ritual where they'll circle the nest several times together. Um, the female will release just a few eggs at a time sort of around the inner rim of the nest and the male sort of follows behind her and kind of fertilizes them in her wake a little bit. Um, and then uh, she pieces out and she's gone and he guards the nest from predators after she leaves. And it's, uh, it's not a big parenting job, thankfully. Um, six to 10 days later typically is when those babies hatched. Um, and, uh, and they're pretty independent right, right from the get-go. So, oh, and a fun little fun fact, if you haven't heard it, is a newly hatched fish is called a fry. So um, perhaps that's because they're very delicious to predators. I don't know. Um, all righty. So uh, not unlike the sunfish, um, an impressive nest can, uh, you know, both attract females, but it can also provide a safe place to deposit eggs. And that's really important. Um, so the next species I'm going to talk about is one of my absolute favorites. He's this big, beautiful guy with those tubercles on his head there, and he is called a river chub. Um, what is unusual about the nests that chubs build is that other species of fish um, are also attracted to the structures. So um, there are over 30 different species of fish that are known to spawn on chub nests in addition to the chubs. Um, and a lot of them are, you know, some of those incredible colorful species that I mentioned earlier. So when you're snorkeling and if you can find a chub nest, man, you are in for a real treat. Um, a chub mound can, uh, can wind up looking like, a, you know, since we're talking about uh, reproduction, maybe you would call it a little bit of a lewd party. Um, do you wanna go ahead and show the video, Tracy? And I'll, uh, we'll show you a quick little video of what we mean here. This is very, very cool if you ever get a chance to happen by it. We sped it up a little bit so you could see the chub. And notice the chub kinda, he leaves the frame and then when he comes back into the frame again, he's got a pebble in his mouth and chubs can lift pebbles the size of their head and they'll go like 200 yards away to find the perfect pebble. And they just come back over and over and over again. Um, these mounds are really, really incredible. Um, they, 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 the chubs before they start lifting rocks spend a lot of time fattening themselves up. Um, so that they've got the, you know, they feed a lot, so they've got the energy to do this work, but they build these domes in these uh, spots where the current is swiftest so that sediment won't settle on them. Um, and then the chub will carry as much as 7,000 stones um, to this spot. And when the nest is done, it can be as tall as, as tall as two feet tall and three feet long. And the reason that's so important and attractive to these other, you know, nesting freeloaders is that the mound lifts away from the river bottom to a point where the sediment is carried away by the river flow and doesn't settle on the mound and smother eggs. Um, and the fact that it's in the middle of the current also increases like the oxygen flow to the eggs so that they're getting nourished. Um, and there's lots of nice tiny crevices in there to keep the eggs safe without them kind of, you know, flowing away too. Um, they're really unique structures. Um, and they're thought to help a lot of other fish species survive in degraded habitat because the mounds, like if there's a lot of silt on the riverbed, the mound itself basically kind of rises up out of the silt and provides these little islands of clean substrate, even if the surrounding habitat is maybe a little bit less suitable for fish breeding. So um, chubs are what's known as ecosystem engineers. And that means they actually construct an important part of the ecosystem that is valuable to the other fish that they share that habitat with. So these guys are one of my favorites. I just think one of the coolest, coolest behaviors in nature. So that's a little bit about fish courtship. Um, pretty, pretty awesome habits that these guys have. And if you can get out into the, into the water in the late spring and early summer, you can actually witness it in action, which is wonderful to see. 
All right, I think we're going to move on to muscles. Trace, you want to do a poll? Mm -hmm. Yes, all right. We're going to launch our next poll. Um, and this one is about muscles. It's going to lead us into reproductive strategy. So the question is, what is the average lifespan of a freshwater mussel? Five to 10 years, 15 to 25 years, 25 to 35 years, or 40 to 60 years? Give you a couple more moments. All right, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. <clears throat> the correct answer is actually 40 to 60 years. And some muscles can live up to 100, believe it or not. But 40 to 60 years is the average lifespan of a freshwater mussel. Um, and Kat is going to talk to us a little bit about that and their really interesting reproductive strategies. Oh yeah, definitely some of the most interesting in the animal world. And I'm looking at the clock and realizing that we're already out of half of our time. So I'm going to try to blow through these as fast as I can because I don't want to um, do anybody, any of our species short shrift. All righty, uh, Tracy, you can go ahead and advance the slide, please. So. Here's a fun thing to ponder. How in the world can you reproduce if you can't physically move more than a few inches over the course of your, you know, 40 plus year life? Um, evolutionarily speaking, I would say muscles have come up with perhaps the most amazing strategy on earth to address that particular problem. Uh, slide. So this is a, a, a quick little graph of the uh, basic life cycle of a mussel, which is probably quite unfamiliar to most. I'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, it's pretty bizarre. Basically, male mussels um, release their sperm straight into the water column and just hope against hope that somewhere downstream, there is a female somewhere who will be able to draw it in through her filter. Mussels are filter fe feeders. They basically only have one in-hole, quote unquote, and everything goes into that in-hole, um, including uh, uh, male spermatozoa is what it's called. I'm throwing all kinds of fun words at you guys today. Um, so the male uh, spermatozoa will fertilize the female's eggs, which she actually broods inside of her gills because she does not have a womb. Um, so here they develop into these tiny, tiny, tiny little larvae, and that's these guys on the left here. Those are called glochidia. Um, and when the glochidia are developed enough, the female releases them out of her gills and or out of her uh, lungs and onto the gills and skin of a fish as basically these tiny temporary little parasites. So for a certain four of their lives, mussels are parasites. Um, over the next sort of few weeks to few months, depending on the species, the glochidia will actually feed from the oxygenated blood of the fish um, they never, it's, it's not a, a relationship that, that causes serious harm to the fish. Um, the fish isn't too bothered by it, but it helps the glochidia to mature. And eventually they metamorphose into tiny little juvenile mussels. And when they're ready, they basically just unlatch from the fish, fall to the stream bed, and they start their lives as, as free living mussels. So what's, I think the most interesting part of this cycle, um, is that you know it is a cycle that cannot be completed without a host of a completely different taxa so muscles require fish to uh to survive and to reproduce into the next generation and some freshwater mussels aren't too picky about their you know their fish babysitters if you will um but others are really really selective and they can only use a single fish spe fish species as a host for their young so the question then is, well, how do they ensure that they find the right fish to do the job? Obviously, mussels don't have eyes, um, so they can't necessarily see who's coming along. And this is where it gets really wild. Mussels have an appendage called a mantle, and it's a little fleshy thing that comes out. They, they crack themselves open. It's a little fleshy thing that comes out. And this mantle is genetically engineered to look so similar 
to a prey item that would be eaten by their, their preferred host fish, that a fish passing along would basically find it irresistible. So the female mussel gets out there and she moves her little mantles around and it kind of mimics the behavior of a small little prey fish. And when the ho fish, host fish comes along and sees that and strikes at it to try and eat it, the female uses that moment to basically squirt her little glochidia all over this guy's face. Um, and that's when they attach themselves to the gills. So we actually have a little video where we can show you what this looks like. And you guys, it is wild. And we borrowed this from our friends at CBD. They produced it seven or eight years ago. And I just think it's the best one out there. Oop, we went backwards, Trace. Hope you guys appreciate the nice bounce chicka wow wow music going on in the background. all right thanks trace i mean really like can we just stop there how amazingly wild is that i just love it um you know i i really love kind of thinking about the fact that you know mussels don't have eyes so they don't know what their host fish species looks like nor do they know what the prey of that species look like and yet over millions of years they've evolved these lures that so perfectly mimic the prey species that you know they're guaranteed to catch a host fish it's like it's mind-boggling it's one of the most oh yes uh whoever sent in on the iphone the fish lives it causes it really does not harm the fish in any way they release it as soon as they've attached their little muscle babies to it um, and the muscle babies do use the fish for nourishment for a little while, but it's uh, it's very minor and it's it's a process in which the fish suffers neither harm, but he also doesn't necessarily benefit from it. Um, but yeah, you know, I think it bears mentioning, of course, that, um, you know, some of these mussels have very specific host fish. So if you if the host fish it declines or becomes imperiled or goes extinct, you know, the mussel has to go extinct along with it because it doesn't have millions of years to adapt to another host fish. So um, yeah, this is just one of the most, you know, this, this is, a, this is a, an evolutionary marvel that took millions of years to accomplish. Nobody really knows how it happens, but to watch it happen is, is an incredible thing. And, and, you know, here in the muscle diversity uh, capital of the US, uh, it's a thing that you can really pretty much go out and see if you know where to look, so. Alrighty, so I think that's going to do us on mussels. Let's talk about my absolute favorite aquatic species in the whole wide world, the hellbender. So we have yeah. talked about courtship and we have talked about uh, making whoopee 
And now we're going to talk about what happens when uh, when little Junior comes along. Mm -hmm. And uh, to start off this topic, we have a uh, trivia question, but I'm not going to launch a poll. I just want you to, if you know the answer, put it in the chat. And the question is, what do you call a hellbender daddy? Does anybody know what you call a hellbender daddy? Guesses are perfectly acceptable. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Throw them out there. Oh, no. Somebody's got to know. Kat, do you want to tell us? All right. Hang on. I like Big Daddy. Samuel. Yes. <laughs> Big Poppy. Yeah. <laughs> Here they come. Charles, <laughs> nice. I love it. I love it. Robert. Robert. Okay, no, very good. good. Very good. Good, good. I love it. I love it. Okay. Well, the answer to the question is, and we'll get into yes, it is definitely Mr. Um the answer to the question is den master. A male hellbender that is protecting and guarding his young is called a den master. Um, and I will talk a little bit about how a hellbender becomes a den master and why hellbenders are some of the best dads in the aquatic species world. All righty. So a little bit of background about hellbenders because I can't resist myself. I could talk about these guys forever. Um, some of you may know that hellbenders are the largest salamander in North America. They're the third largest salamander in the world. Um, they can get up to almost two feet long and they can live extremely long lives. We think at least 40 years in the wild, but there's evidence to suggest that they can live maybe up to 60 or 70 years. Um, they are very solitary creatures. Their social lives um, are, are pretty non-existent most of the time. They're also semi-territorial. So they like to live in these cool, fast flowing uh, streams with plenty of unembedded rocky substrate. And so that's what I'm, I'm showing you here is, you know, there's a lot of movement in that water. There's a lot of good oxygen. Hellbenders um, only have relic lungs, they breathe through their skin. So they need to have lots of well oxygenated water to survive. There also needs to not be too much silt or other um, kind of debris or pollutants in a waterway because they need these very small um, crevices underneath of unembedded rocks to be able to go in and make their nests and make their homes. And once a hellbender has, has uh, found the cavity that he likes, um, an adult hellbender may, may maintain a home there for the majority of its life. There are, um, down in the Davidson River where we do hellbender surveys every year, there are a handful of hellbenders that we know where they live and we know their rocks so well um, that 100% of the time, if we go to check and they're there, they're there. We've named most of them. Um, so they're kind of our local guys, but they're very, very, they have what's called high site fidelity and they do not like visitors in their neighborhood. They might tolerate another one passing through, but they don't socialize and they don't want their neighbor's nest rock to be close to their nest rock. So that is how they spend most of their lives. Uh, but for about three weeks out of the year, um, that changes pretty dramatically in late August and early September for a very, very short period of time. Um, something flips a switch in them and we don't know what it is exactly. It doesn't seem to be water temperature. It doesn't seem to be photo period, but something flips a switch in them and their behavior changes drastically. Uh, they get really, really frenzied. They start coming out during the day, which is atypical. And the young males in particular start getting out and looking around in search of the perfect nest rock because they want to become an established male. And then the older males that have, you know, already had a good nest rock for a long time, they'll be in there, um, you know, sort of defending their nesting site from, from potential invasions. And, um, you know, the battle over these nest sites can be really, really fierce because obviously every male hellbender wants to be as attractive as possible to the females. Um, so once a, a, they've kind of firmly established their nest site and they've posted up and they've guarded and they're sure no other males are gonna come in. They guard that entrance and their head is just barely sticking out 
and um, there's no way for anybody to get in unless the hellbender wants them to. And when that, you know, lady caller might happen by, he makes some room for her and invites her in. And, uh, and that is when he officially becomes a den master. So Tracy, I don't know if you saw this, but if you could start the video at 315, we're going to just watch for about 45 seconds. So I can show you this awesome male behavior. Yeah, that's perfect. They seem to just spend the whole year feeding and doing their own thing. Then around the end of August, early September, all of a sudden, something triggers the males to go completely crazy. And they start fighting with each other. Females are drawn to certain rocks that have been a male has staked out as the best nesting rock. And he'll, he'll defend that rock. This uh, this role that you're seeing here, um, that wild twist, is thought to be nobody exactly knows how Hellbenders got their name, but um, it's theorized that the bender part of Hellbender. That's great, Tracy. That's far enough. Um, the bender part of Hellbender might come from that from that wild twisting behavior that they do. Um, so you can see it's it's a pretty territorial, aggressive time uh in a male hellbender's life um and an amazing thing to watch truly okay so when a female does come along um she may enter the den willingly but also the male might come out and kind of corral her in they're not known for being terribly romantic species um but once she is in the den um she'll go ahead and deposit these sort of two long kind of strings of eggs that sort of mass around in a cluster um and uh, the male sort of stands next to her and kind of fertilizes them basically as they are laid. It's kind of interesting because um, uh, hell, uh, hellbenders are really the only salamanders that we know of in North America that fertilize eggs externally. Other terrestrial hellbender, or terrestrial salamanders actually mate more traditionally, but this, these guys more like fish because they're fully aquatic, um, they have this external fertilization. Um, and so she's going to lay about 200 to 400 eggs um, on this, uh, the nice unsilted nest bed. Uh, the male's going to fertilizing, fertilize them. Uh, the whole affair is very uh, unsteamy. Um, and as soon as it's over, uh, the male immediately kicks the female out of the nest. He is much more interested in being a single dad. And, um, and then he gets on with his business. And what you can see here the reason you're able to get a view of this is because this structure is actually an artificial nesting structure um, that we put in place in some um, subpar habitat that allows um, the animals to find uh, better places to nest when there isn't a lot of available nesting structure. So, so you can see the male's head sort of hanging out there and these uh, big, they're quite large, uh, egg strings of eggs in the middle and then that's over there on the right that's the body of the female you can just barely see as well so that's what it looks like um so while the eggs develop you know dad is doing his job he's guarding them from predators uh and there are a great many because hellbender eggs are, are incredibly rich in protein and they're nutritious so people like to eat them or people critters like to eat them um Another thing that's cool is you kind of saw these are, you know, big, long animals with huge paddle shaped tails. And what the what the male does is he kind of uses this paddle shaped tail in this gentle waving motion like this constantly. And what that does is it moves the eggs, it circulates them just enough to provide oxygen to get through the membrane of that egg to make sure that um, that they develop properly. And without that, you know, if the male were to abandon the nest, those those young would die. Um, so that that male parental care is essential. Uh, the eggs will incubate for 68 to 75 days. And um, if all goes to plan, they'll hatch. The larvae are about an inch long when they're born. Um, and they still have a little bit of their yolk sac from the egg remaining. And so they'll feed off of that for several weeks inside the nest before they have to leave and start going in search of food on their own. Um, the the male will continue to guard the nest during that time as they're developing um but they can't hang around for too long once that yolk is gone they really got to get up and get out because there are some studies that suggest that uh at a certain point dad's gonna kind of get sick of having all those kids in the house and he will start eating them so it's a it's a pretty carefully timed 
pretty carefully timed thing. All right, I think that's all I have on the wild world of hellbenders, but uh, feel free to ask me more because like I said, I will talk about them till kingdom come. All right, I wanna move on quickly now towards the end to a slightly less uh, exciting topic, but I think it bears mentioning since uh, you know we talked at the beginning of this presentation about how it took millions of years of evolution uh, to develop you know these incredible species with their you know their fascinating love lives and and all their interesting behaviors and I really want to point out that like you know these well this is going to sound a little corny but these are romance stories in a way and they're coming very very close to an end for a lot of these species uh, aquatic species in the region are in very serious peril and a lot of them have already been declared extinct we had uh, six more get declared fish and mussel species in Appalachia get declared extinct just last year. Um, and it's, uh, you know, that's a really tragic end to a story that took millions of years to write. So um, I'll talk very quickly about some of the threats that imperiled aquatic space. These are largely similar threats to anything that lives in an aquatic system uh, in southern Appalachia. And you can go to the next slide, Tracy. Um, so these are, these are some of the main examples. Resource extraction is probably pretty familiar to most folks in Southern Appalachia. Mining is um, uh, mountaintop removal mining, um, you know, causes entire streams to be buried. It releases toxic waste into, um, into watersheds. Forestry, uh, you know, clear cut forestry causes so soil erosion and the loss of shade from trees uh, causes the temperature of streams to rise, which can make it unsuitable for certain species. Agriculture is a source of numerous uh, threats to freshwater, everything from pesticides and herbicides to fertilizers that um, throw off the balance in the water. Um, and then just good old fashioned silt, um, you know, erosion of stream banks because of livestock or runoff from poorly managed fields can cause this fine silt and dirt to go in and, and, and um, you know, change the quality of the stream beds so that animals can't feed or nest in that stream anymore. Um, some of the biggest problems from development are impervious surfaces. So, you know, parking lots, parking lots are the bane of my existence because nothing can permeate through them into the water table. It all just runs off and winds up in a stream somewhere, um, whether that's engine oil from a car or just, you know, general city gunk. Uh, dams, large and small, and even things like little culverts, that's what's called a perched culvert down in that bottom right hand corner there. Um, those are barriers to passage, so fish and other species can't move across those barriers, so they can't spread their, they can't share their genes and populations get cut off from each other. And then of course climate change, we're all starting to experience it. It causes temperature changes in the water, not just the air, um, and it increases the risk of flood and drought, and those are things that um, a lot of these species are not genetically engineered to to tolerate. So there's a lot out there to a lot out there to um, be concerned about. Uh, next slide, Tracy. But we are doing our best at defenders to try and um, intervene where we can and change that narrative in Southern Appalachia. Uh, you can go to the next slide. I'll tell you just really, really quickly about a few of the things that I work on in Southern Appalachia. I really, really encourage folks who are local, if you've got any questions about any of our activities, reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about them more. If you or an organization that you're a part of is interested in getting involved, we've always, always, always got room. Um, the first one is the Tennessee River Basin Network. And this is a large um, uh, landscape scale conservation collaborative group that is focuses on the Tennessee River Basin. So a lot of it's in Tennessee, but parts of it are in the surrounding states as well. Um, and really what we do is we act as a kind of incubator for our member organizations, whether that's, um, you know, somebody from um, Volkswagen, who is a part of our coalition because they've got a plant in Chattanooga to a local municipality or a university or an NGO. And we try to bring those folks together to kind of leverage their collective resources to um, solve, solve the aquatic biodiversity challenges of the basin. I do a lot of work with the US Department of Agriculture. I'm a bit of a policy nerd, so I have a team of folks that I work with where we develop policy proposals um, that are uh, basically to advance more wildlife friendly um, um, practices for farmers. And we do that through a large major piece of legislation called the Farm Bill. I also work directly with the state 
agencies um, on what's called a state technical advisory committee. And I'm on a few of those in several states where it's a forum for stakeholders to engage with the um, the department that is you know, responsible for connecting farmers with conservation resources. And we work with them to kind of advise where those resources go and how they're spent in, you know, to make it in a manner that is wildlife friendly as much as possible. Um, a special initiative that I founded several years ago that is a, um, an initiative of Defenders is the Southeastern Hellbender Conservation Initiative. It focuses on private lands because so much of the historic habitat of these aquatic species occurs on private lands. We don't have that many federal lands in the Southeast. And so to get conservation done, you really can't do it without private landowners. And so we work to make technical expertise and um, um, financial support available to both agricultural and non-agricultural private landowners so that they have the resources that they need to adapt more sustainable practices. Um, we work with small locally driven uh, community organizations in uh, mine country in southwestern Virginia and Tennessee to um, to protect their communities from the impacts of mining and to hold the federal and state agencies that oversee mine permitting um, accountable and make sure that they're doing their due diligence on mine lands. Um, and then a little bit, and I tend not to do this work as much, most of my stuff is collaborative, but every so often, um, we you know find that it's appropriate to get in there and and hold folks accountable when they're not um you know when they're not complying with the law or what they're not doing their due diligence um to protect aquatic species so there are individual cases like um this one mine issue i'm working on right now the volunteer sand and gravel mine which is a mine on the duck river that is um badly permitted and dumping a lot of silt into the most biodiverse river in North America, which is the duck. Um, and so we are working with partners and with federal agencies to try and hold them accountable and get them to mitigate some of their impacts. Um, we work with the Fish and Wildlife Service to make sure that species that are really in trouble are protected through the ESA and to not let species go off of the Endangered Species Act list before they're ready. Um, and we also make sure to show up as a stakeholder um, for the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, which is um, has a lot of control over management of imperiled species and um, could could be doing more um, and investing their resources more wisely to protect imperiled species. And so we we try to use our voice as a stakeholder to compel them to do that. So so we're out there. We're doing our best and we're always trying to do it in partnership with other concerned individuals and organizations who might have um, who might have a stake. Uh, I think I'm done with that slide finally, Tracy. And then how to help. And I'm just looking at the clock and realizing that we only have a few seconds left. So um, I'll let you read this real quickly. These are just a few short suggestions that I wanted to throw out there. If folks care about these critters and they're interested in learning more or doing more to protect the biodiversity of our region, there are so many ways for you to get engaged. And if you're interested in doing so, I am happy to help you find them. And you can go to the next slide, Trace. This is just a, a list of some of the most important things that you can do if you own water or if you're adjacent to water, you can try to protect it from onshore impacts. You can always engage with your community to clean up waterways. Please, please, please don't ever, um, you know, move large piles of rocks when you're out in nature. It's important habitat for aquatic species and don't dump stuff down the drain. So these are all things that you can do no matter where you live that help protect uh, aquatic habitat. Okay, Trace. And then finally, we wanted to let you know, oh gosh, we're going to run over on this preview. So I'll wrap it up by saying we wanted to let you know that we're going to be doing a lot of outreach in the region this year, particularly in Tennessee, but um, everyone is welcome. We're going to be doing several screenings of this incredible film, Hidden Rivers of Appalachia, and we're going to have expert panels out to talk and interact with folks who want to come and see this amazing one hour film. Uh, that has won awards in several environmental film fests. And we're going to sort of use that as a as a ground, as a framework to introduce folks to the biodiversity of the region and get folks engaged who want to in helping to protect it. So Trace, with one minute left, I'll pass it to you and let you make the decision of whether or not we want to run over by a couple of minutes to show that preview. 
Um, I think not. I want to. I want to um, launch the last polling question, and then if folks want to stay over a little bit, and you have questions, um, we'd love to uh, hear your questions and discuss them with you. We we're we're happy to stay on it, um, however long, you know, you'd like. So yeah. Um, Sorry, that's my bad. I'm so bad at keeping time when it comes to PowerPoint. So that's completely well, on me. There's a lot to talk about. So here's the last question. Um, did you learn something new about freshwater species or our efforts to protect them today? And <clears throat> would you ask a hellbender to be your Valentine? <laughs> <laughs> Yay, we had good learning. Yeah, it's great. All right. All right. Everyone has responded. I'm going to end the poll and share results. And yes, 100%. Everybody learned something. Oh, I'm today. so glad. Yay. Um, we got some you bets on asking a hellbender to be a Valentine. <laughs> Slimy but lovable. Slimy but lovable. <laughs> we got one no way and not likely, but I appreciate them now more I'll than take before. That. Yeah, I'll take that. absolutely. Um, and folks, if you want to stay on and ask questions, uh, we are here to um, to help answer them for you. And if you do have a minute to stay on, um, I really encourage it because the Hidden Rivers film is, I mean, truly one of the most astonishing pieces of, of art I've ever seen. And I would love for you guys to get a sneak peek at it. And if you're interested in seeing the whole film, get in touch with us. We'll let you know about our upcoming outreach events and whether or not we've got any coming up in your area. Um, this is such an incredible film and getting an opportunity to, uh, to have a free showing of it and talk to some of the folks who helped to get it made uh is a lot of fun great all right i'm gonna play it okay if you have questions feel free to put them in the chat attracted to uh, beauty and there is an enormous amount of beauty in this water. You know, I hear music when I listen to the streams out here and I love just listening to the water. some wonderful, wonderful things in our rivers. This is the hot spot. There's more species of freshwater fish, crayfish, salamanders, mussels. There's more of it here than anywhere else in the temperate world. Just a, a great diversity of species and sizes behaviors and colors and shapes are all found within these waters. A hot summer day and you put your head in that water and you're surrounded by life and turtles and fish and salamanders and all kind of creatures big and small and colorful and all darting about. It was amazing. I mean, you're, you're in the water with an incredible amount of life. I mean, it's water is life. There's a lot of diversity here and there's a lot to be proud of. And all of these animals are just kind of hidden from us because they occur in the water. 
reds and blues and yellows and all of these colors I thought only occurred on coral reefs. And then you dip your head into southeastern rivers and discover that you have these amazing colors here in your backyard. And there's so much just right here that we definitely got to know and learn and celebrate and protect. Just getting in the water in a healthy stream and experiencing it for what it is, is the spectacular reason that drives me to the water whenever I can. I got fish nibbling on me. All right. I think that wraps us up, you guys. Thanks for sticking around for a few extra minutes. Um, here is our contact information. Please, please, please feel free to reach out to us. We have opportunities to get engaged. We have opportunities um, for volunteerism around, um, around helping to protect, uh, protect some of our rivers and some of these particular species. Um, any, in, we're happy to share information and educate. Um, you know, we want uh, we want our folks in the southeast to know what we're doing and to feel like they're a part of what we're doing. So reach out anytime. <laughs>